Well, good morning, New Life family. Thank you guys so much for joining us for Sunday service today. My name is Brandon. Whether you're joining us in the room or on our live stream today, we are so excited that you decided to spend a part of your Sunday right here with us. Our countdown video is about to get underway here in just a few seconds. So if you can hear my voice, whether you're getting coffee downstairs, you're in the lobby or you're somewhere else in your house right now, now is a great time to come in and get ready for service. Welcome to Sunday service here at New Life.
And we have some of our kids from BBS. And I just want to say, if you served at BBS, could you just raise your hand for a second? Any of our servants? Can we give these guys a hand? Man, what an awesome thing to invest in the next generation. You know, Psalm 145, verse 4 says, one generation will commend his works to the next. And that's what's beautiful about serving God in the church. We get to pour out love and, and just help these young kids know that God is real, that God loves you, and that, that there's hope for us. And man, what, a, what an amazing message to be able to pass on to the next generation. I'm grateful for those people who chose to do that for me, and I know you are too. So we're just so excited that you guys are with us today and worshiping with us. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna sing this song next called "Same God." And the the message of this song is, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and it's still true. So let's sing. Come on, let's continue to worship today.
But not the end we could have hoped for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what a sacrifice was made as the heavens
believe right now in this room, just believe that the kingship of Jesus is resting in this room right now. I just believe the Holy Spirit just wants to remind us, Jesus is king. Jesus is king. He is sovereign over all. There's absolutely nothing in this life or in the life to come or in all of the past that could ever come against the authority of Jesus. His reign and his rule was established before the beginning of time. The scriptures tell us that he was, he was with God in the beginning. The word was with him and the word was God. And through him, all things were made and through him, all things have life and were given breath. And therefore he is sovereign over all, he is king. We do not serve a God and a savior who is, who is unable to do anything. He is able to do anything right now. And I just believe that we as his people need to begin to believe that he can do anything. So right now, I don't know where you're at, but if you could just, you could close your eyes right now. If you feel comfortable, you could find a place to just even kneel at the feet of Jesus. There's space in this room. If you just wanna find a place to, let's just approach Jesus as King this morning. If you have a need in your life, I promise you he already knows. He already knows what you need. He already knows that you, you desire to be free from whatever it is. He already knows that you need provision. The scriptures tell us he already knows, he already sees. So right now he just wants us to approach him as king. And can we do that in this time right now that we have? Lord, I just pray right now, God, that your healing presence would be here, God, that you would heal, God, where healing is needed, God. I pray that you would pour out provision for your people, God as a great king who loves to, to give to his people and to provide for his people. God, I believe that's your nature and that's your heart, God. So I just pray the provision would be poured out today over each and every situation. God, I just wanna pray right now that you would be the father to the fatherless. God, that you would be hope to the hopeless. God, that you would be King Jesus in this place right now. God, we desire what you have for us more than anything else the world can provide. God, we recognize right now that we are part of your kingdom, that you're establishing even here right now on this earth. God, and we get to, to be part of that kingdom only because of the shed blood of Jesus. I thank you for making us a people we just want to worship you this morning, God, for, for the king that you are. Come on, let's begin to sing this again. All hail. All hail, King Jesus. Come on, every voice. All hail, Lord of heaven and earth. All hail, King Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray right now, God, that you, your presence just continues to dwell in this place, God. We know you're here. God, we worship you. We praise you, God. We know you have so much to show us and reveal to us today about your nature, about who you are. God, and we just want to be your people. We thank you, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 And I'm so excited to see all of you today. Um, can we give our kids another hand here as they go back to their class? This is awesome having our kids in here worshiping with us. Well, if you would right now turn around and greet somebody, say hello before you take your seats. Well, good morning, New Life Church. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Can we give it up, church, for all of our first-time guests this morning? Woo! We are so glad that you're here today. Whether you're sitting in the auditorium or you're watching online this morning, we welcome you to New Life Church. We are a church that cares about you. We care about our community. We're so glad that you're here today. But if you are a first-time guest, I have a favor to ask of you this morning. Before you leave today, if you're in the auditorium, if you're a first-time guest, if you'll go by our first-time guest booth, walk up to a friendly volunteer that's there and just say, you know what, I'm a first-time guest. Enter in your contact information into the iPad there. That'll let us know that you're here. We can establish a connection and somewhat of a relationship with you here at the beginning stage because we believe that you're going to want to come back again. We do believe that. And on your second and third visit, we're going to place a free gift in your hand just as our way to say thank you for spending your Sundays with us. If you're watching online today and this is your first time tuning in to New Life Church, we certainly encourage you to text the word guest to 678-909-1222. That lets us know of your attendance here as well today and let us know how we can serve you too. Amen. Well, one of the things that we like about New Life Church that I love about New Church, New Life Church really is the fact that we believe in the power of prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer captures the heart of God. How many of you know that God loves when we talk to Him? Yeah. How many of you know that God loves to talk to us back, right? And he does that. So we, we believe in the power of prayer. So in the seat pocket in front of you, there are these blue prayer and care cards. You want to let us know what your prayer needs are. The only way we can know what they are is if you fill these out. If you'll fill those out and let us know if it's a prayer need or a praise report, if God has already answered the prayer, that's great. There are also some items there for you to check if you'd like to have a little more pastoral care alongside you. We're welcome to do that as well, too. If you're watching online this morning, if you'll text guest, to, I'm sorry, if you'll text prayer to that number on the screen, you'll get a digital version of this card that I'm holding in my hand. It'll let us know what your prayer needs are as well. And prayer does, in fact, change things. Well, before we go into the offering this morning, I want to just let you know that Back to School Giveaway is this Saturday. What an awesome, yes, what an awesome day it's going to be. We have 500 kids, not counting parents. It's going to be like a thousand people here on Saturday, y'all. It's going to be a big day, and your generosity allows us to, to bless those kids, to bless them as they go back to school. So I want to encourage you this morning. Pastor Allen mentioned last week, if you'd like to give over your tithes and your offerings, say, like, you know what, I just want to be a part of the back-to-school outreach. I want to remind you that you still have opportunity to give and to sow into this event that's going to take place this Saturday. Also, while I'm thinking about it, if you're Spanish speaking, if you know how to speak Spanish, we could use your help. So if you could do that, can help us out with the event. If you'll see me after service today, I'd like to know who you are. We'll get your name and your number. And we'll make some connections and let you know how we need your help on Saturday. But that would be a wonderful thing indeed. And again, on those blue prayer and praise cards, I meant to mention this earlier. I did not. Please make sure you put them in the offering bucket as they come by this morning. Well, folks, it's time to give this morning. Amen. Come on. Come on. Clap. We clap. Clapping for offerings is a part of our culture here at New Life because we have come to understand that God loves cheerful givers. He loves those who open up their hands and their hearts 
and their wallets because really, church, it's all his. Anyhow, how many of you know we're just stewards of all of God's possessions that he's given us? And so he asked us, would you, would you trust me? Would you put your tithe in the offering buckets and trust me and see if I not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon them that you cannot contain? So we tithe out of obedience, but we also give in our offerings as our way to express extravagant love to him, even more so that, God, we trust you with everything that we have and everything that we are. So I want to encourage you to give in the offerings today as God has laid upon your heart this morning. Ushers, would you come? Come now. Would you come and get ready to prepare to pass those buckets down the aisles? And church, if you'll open up again, you'll fill up your hearts this morning in your giving, that would be great. And God will be honored in everything that's given today. Would you help me pray? Father, Lord, we thank you once again for the fact that we have the opportunity to give in the offering today. Lord, your word tells us that you delight in those who cheerfully give, not grudgingly. So Lord, we open up our hearts, we open up our hands this morning to say, yes, Lord, would you just take everything that we can place in these offerings today, those items that you've entrusted us with, we give them back to you. God, would you take it and multiply it over for kingdom purpose throughout this church for the glory of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name and everyone would say, amen. amen. Now would you watch the screen this morning for the morning announcements. Good morning, New Life family, and thank you for joining us in person and online today. We are so happy that you're here with us, and we wanted to share some updates on what's going on around the church. As we prepare to launch the School of Discipleship this year, we are hosting a second informational meeting on Sunday, July 31st at 6 p.m. here at the church. There is no cost for this event, and registration is required. Also, there will be light refreshments provided, and child care is also available. You can get more details and get registered on our events page at newlifecanton.com. Also, enrollment for the New Life School of Discipleship is now open. The cost is $250 per semester, and our first semester is launching this August. You can get registered and get more details on the School of Discipleship tab on the homepage of our website. Click the name and it will take you to some frequently asked questions, registration, and more. Our annual Back to School Giveaway Outreach is happening on July 23rd and we have lots of volunteer opportunities available for this day. During this outreach, kids and families from all over Cherokee County will be on campus and will get free backpacks, clothing, and shoes. We need an army of volunteers who can be a part of this special day to help make sure these kids go back to school feeling confident in themselves. We are also pledging more than ever to ensure everyone who steps on the campus will not leave empty-handed. To register to volunteer or make a donation, visit our events page at newlifecanton.com. Whether you join us in person or online, these are just a few of the ways to get involved and to grow in your walk with Jesus here at New Life. Because our heart is for you to be connected to your God-given purpose. Amen. Well, there are so many great activities here at New Life Church for you to participate in. There's all kinds of ways for you to connect with the ministries of our church. Well, guess what? We are in week number four of our Summer Alive series. That's not a series. We've had guest speakers so far. I'm not a guest, but I got to preach, and I'm always excited about that. And then last Sunday, we had Dr. Josh Rice, the director of our school discipleship, preach last week. How many of you enjoyed Dr. Josh Rice last week? Fantastic. He did a marvelous job, and I'm so excited about the School of Discipleship that's launching this August. You want to make sure that you take a part of that opportunity. And then next Sunday, we have another guest speaker. His name is Mike Atkins. If you came to the men's conference, you will understand that he's a powerful and dynamic speaker as well. So you want to make sure that you're here for next Sunday. But today, we have a special treat. How many of you like special treats? I love special treats. We have a guest speaker today who was, our, who was our student pastor here for three and a half years, Pastor Tyler Harris over here to my left and to your right. Woo-hoo! Yeah, come on up, Tyler. He and his wife, Kayla, and their kids are, are with us today, and we're so glad. I think he's got some folks from his church, and I'm sure he'll address more of that. But we love Pastor Tyler. He's a friend of the New Life Church. He was, was able to go and plant a church in Cartersville just down the road. But we're very excited. Hey, you're, oh, I forgot how tall you were. <laughs> Well, we're so excited for Pastor Tyler to be here today, church. We'd let him know one more time that you love him today. Thank you. Amen. Amen. What's well, good to see you, New Life? How you doing today? Y'all feeling good? Y'all need to be a little more caffeinated than the 930. Y'all got to finish your whole coffee before you came in, and so you, you ain't got no excuses to be asleep today. Man, it's so good to be with you all, and man, it's just, it's so good to be back at New Life, and of course, 
we transitioned and, and God opened the door for us to plant the church that we're at. But how many of you know, even when you move out of mom and dad's house, when you go back to mom and dad's house, it's still home? Y'all feel that? Y'all feel it? It's that way for us coming back to new life. We still love y'all so much and are so appreciative of all that you've done. And you'll never know the investment of just love and hospitality and confidence and, and resources that you all made into our family and made the dream to plant Awaken Church possible. And so thank you so much for that. And, uh, man, we're just excited to be here. Of course, we love Pastor JB. We love the staff. And I didn't do this in the first service, but I, I want to give honor not just to Pastor Allen and Pastor JB. Obviously, I'll do that. But I want to give honor to your entire team here at New Life. Y'all have a killer staff. Killer staff. <laughs> Pastor Thomas giving y'all seminary-level instruction during that worship session. I'm telling you, that is powerful stuff. And then, of course, Sarah was our replacement as in youth ministry, and Ari and Zach, Sarah, Jamora, they're all just killing it down there. If you have a student, you need to get them here on Wednesday nights because it is amazing. They're doing a fantastic job, and so we love them so much. And, of course, all the rest of the staff, Brandon, Vanessa, and, and I'll miss somebody. That's why you don't name people because you'll miss people, but love them to death. I mean, so grateful for their friendship and investment into our family. I do want to say it's good this morning. We got some of my Awakened Church family in the house. Yeah, I told them. I told them. I said, now I'm going to call y'all out. If y'all make me look stupid by not making any noise, we're going to have a problem. And so y'all did good. Y'all answered good and loud. And so, so glad that they're with us. And before I do get into the word, I do want to honor Pastor Allen. And man, I love, I love your pastor. And not because he was my boss and not because he gave me a platform today, but because he's become my friend. And him and Miss Kathy have invested in my wife and I, and they continue to invest in our family. And I'm going to tell you something today. You are led not by just a good preacher. You are led not just by a family that is doing their best to follow Jesus. You are led by a man and a woman of God. And I say that with the most sincerity. They are legitimate, and so we love them. And I, if he's watching today by live stream, Pastor, I love you. We love you, Miss Kathy. We are sorry that you're having to go through the trial that you're going through right now at Lake Tahoe. We pray God delivers you and gets you out of there. And uh, it's, it's tough, but you know, these are the afflictions of the righteous. So 1 Kings chapter number 18. I, of course, want to honor my wife as well. She's on the front row. She's the champion of our entire team. She's why anything's possible. And I think, I, I, think I'm through, I think I'm through all the commercials now. We're going to get to the paid programming. This is different today. I preached this morning, and it's really fun to preach here when, honestly, it's not even a consideration. Could I get fired for this? Like, it's awesome. This is the first time I preached here when I wasn't on staff. And so um, I can't be fired, so that's fantastic. First Kings chapter number 18, verse number 37. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Look at this verse. This is like, I don't know if I got any Pentecostals in the room, but if you're Pentecostal, this is our kind of verse. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I could preach a whole message about that this was real revival because a lot of us just see the fire fall and we get satisfied there. That's not the revival verse. The revival verse is then all the people fell on their face and said the Lord is God. That's revival. Not when you see fire, when you see repentance. That's when revival shown up on the scene. They fall on their face. They say the Lord is God. Go through to Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together. Say that all things work together. That was not together, but we, you said it. It was said. For good... To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I want to marry these two verses, these two passages in just a moment today. But before we get into the word, I do want to say a word of prayer. That God would just prepare our hearts to receive from him today. Would you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you for your presence we've already felt. I do thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne. And Lord, there's a lot of stuff going crazy in the world, but there's still the same God that's on the throne. And so we thank you for that today. We position our hearts to hear from you. I pray that your spirit would go forth and break the yoke of bondage. Lord, I just pray you would help us to hear what we need to hear. Help me to say what I need to say. We give you glory for what you're going to do in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I came on staff, uh, we came and had an interview process here. And pastor was walking us around and 
showing us the facility and, of course, you know, and introducing us to everybody and, and all the things that you do during an interview session. And about the time we were about to go to lunch and, and have the lunch with the staff, he walked us downstairs and opened up the basement and brought us in. How many of you guys have been here for more than, than four years if you're in the room? I know this is second service. This is where a lot of new people come. we got a few that have been here for more than four years. The basement was not always what it is now. If you've been down there and you've seen that it's a pretty cool space, used to, it was a space, um, but there was a lot of junk, for lack of a better word. There's a lot other words that you can say. We'll just say junk to keep it good for church today. There was a lot of stuff down there that needed to be cleared out. And he walked me down there and he said, hey, we want this to be a student and young adult space and started casting vision for that. I mean, I got super excited about the concept of just this whole renovation of this space to have a space for student ministry and young adult ministry. And then, of course, when they, when they finally did offer the job to us, that was one of the main things. One of my main first priorities when I got here was to have a vision and a plan for what to do with that space. And I was so excited about that. Just the, the, the concept, it's a room as big as this, and you can have an, an amazing space for students and young adults to hang out. The vision was so exciting. But then I got here, and we started having work days to clean out that space. And as exciting as the vision was, the work days were not nearly as exciting. We started taking stuff out, and man, we, we, tried, to, we tried to tap into the whole cultural like, excitement about like storage wars. and be like, if you come, you can have anything you find down there. And so people came. That first work day, we had like 60 people. The second one, we had like four. And so it was, it was crazy. Everybody's like, this is, this is the worst thing ever. Like, no one wants to come and do a work day cleaning out junk. And so, I mean, for like a year, we just had work day. It seemed like every other month we were having another work day and cleaning stuff out. And finally, we got it cleaned out and got the drywall hung and, and came and got all that done and painted and finished. And this whole process was just this long process. The vision was so exciting. Well, then it was finally ready for furniture. We went to this real fancy furniture store online called Walmart, and we ordered a whole bunch of stuff. And all of the, here's the thing about any furniture you order online. They don't deliver to you like a nicely finished piece of furniture. They bring you like 4,000 boxes and say, hey, I hope you find all the parts. Like, just best of luck to you. And so I'm excited about the vision of this place. And we get all this stuff. And at this point in my ministry, I had not learned the art of delegation. And so I can tell you with certainty that there are 64 metal chairs down there. There are six bistro tables. There are 24 stools. I can tell you every piece of furniture. You know why? Because I put them all together. That's why I can tell you every piece of furniture down there. And I can tell you as excited as I was about the vision of transforming that space, I wasn't as excited during work days. I wasn't as excited sitting in my room putting the chair, sitting in my, my living room putting the chairs together. It wasn't in my room. That'd be weird. I wasn't, I wasn't excited about that. It didn't pump me up. It was, it was exciting to have a vision and a place you're going, but the process to get there, not so exciting. My big idea today is actually my sermon title, and it's this, that moments of power require seasons of process. If you're going to arrive at the place that God has for you and you're going to do something significant, God's going to get you with the vision of where you're going. But then he's going to throw in a process that you really didn't know you were agreeing to when you stepped into it. It's not because God's a bait and switch kind of God. It's because he knows if he showed you every step of the process, you probably wouldn't say yes to him. So he shows you the end game. So we opened up our text today about a guy named Elijah. And we're shown this picture of him standing on, the, on, on Mount Carmel. And let me, just, let me just warn you real quick as I get into this word that I preached in first service and I ain't been preaching in two services in a minute. And so I, I was not moving quite fast enough. I'm going to move fast because I ran out of time and only got like a quarter of it. So just pack you a sack lunch today because we can be here for a minute. I don't say that to scare you. I just need to let you know that I got to get this out because I believe it's going to help somebody today. But Elijah, we're shown on Mount Carmel. And he has this powerful moment where fire falls from heaven, consumes the sacrifice. Baal worship is eliminated from the society. Like he prays and rain comes back to heaven after the drought. It's this powerful moment where Elijah steps into the fulfillment, the moment where he is now in the office as prophet of Israel. It's an awesome moment, but it's not where his story began. It's not where his story started. It's where a lot of us would know of him. It's one of the most popular parts of his life. But his story began in 1 Kings chapter 17. So let's go there. Verse number one. And Elijah the Tishbite, 
of the inhabitants of Gilead, which just a second, let's pause right there, because it doesn't say that Elijah was a prophet or Elijah was the son of a prophet or Elijah was the son of a priestly line. It doesn't give us any of that. It says Elijah was a Tishbite from Tishbe. Now, there's theological significance to that. It means that he was a guy from a place called Tishbe. That's what it means. That's why Scripture tells us that. You're like, well, why does that matter? Because he had no spiritual pedigree. He had nothing that separated him from other people based on his, his religious merit or based on who his family was. He was just a normal dude from a normal place. And I fully believe that prophetically that the revival that God wants to send on our nation and that what God wants to do in the last days is not something that he's going to release solely through prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers. I believe it's going to be when Phil from accounting gets filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and begins to tell his department about a God that's moving. I think it's when Susie from HR all of a sudden says, man, I had an experience with God and I got to tell somebody about it because... Sometimes God likes to use Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe, the normal person that doesn't have anything real special about them, but they make themselves available to God. So Elijah makes himself available, and he gets filled. Let's continue reading verse number, the second part of verse number 1. This Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel is, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these years except at my word. His first assignment is to speak to the king. Like, that's a crazy starting point for some random dude from a random place. Your first assignment from God is to tell the king, hey, guess what? You're doing a terrible job. Judgment is coming to your nation. How many of y'all want to sign up for that job? Like, yeah, let's do it. Elijah gets this, this crazy first assignment, and so he goes to him and prophesies this. says, there will be no dew or rain for these years except at my word. Now, Elijah is called to be a prophet. And I wish I could go back in time. And be there when Elijah shows up to Ahab's house to tell him he's doing it wrong. Because he didn't realize that prophets are supposed to say like, you're going to be blessed with a 30-fold, 60-fold, 90-fold blessing. That your cup's going to run over and you're going to have the biggest house and the nice end. It's going to be favor and it's going to be awesome and it's going to be all these good things. He, he, he didn't get the memo that when you prophesy it's supposed to be good things. Like Elijah missed the memo. Because when Elijah shows up and starts prophesying what God told him to say, he said, hey, guess what? Drought's coming. Now, we think that it's always going to be, when, when I'm in the will of God, it's going to be a season of abundance and blessing and favor. And my house is going to be bigger. My car is going to be nicer. My bank account is going to be fuller. My relationships are going to be awesome. And I'm never going to face any struggles if I follow Jesus. But Elijah shows us that sometimes the way God moves is he dries stuff up. Sometimes the way God moves is he subtracts things instead of adding things. Elijah shows us this crazy truth about God, that sometimes the move of God is a struggle. It's you enter into a higher level of struggle. But let me just preach for just a minute to let you know that I would rather struggle in the will of God than prosper outside of it. I'd rather have a season where it's hard, but I know I'm where God told me to be, and that I can trust that he's with me even in the hard times. I'm going to tell you something. As a nation, I think we all get too worked up about stuff because we got to understand there's been governmental turmoil before. There'll be governmental turmoil again. There's been financial problems before. There'll be financial problems again. But if you and I will make our source something that is not the government or the economy or whatever, then I believe that even if I can walk in a struggle in the will of God, I'd rather struggle in his will than prosper outside of it. So Elijah prophesied, said, hey, it's about to get dry. And the crazy thing is, is that it seems like this is an antithetical thing for a prophet to say to garner influence and to garner uh, an audience with the king. But he prophesies this. And the truth is that if it would have been a season of plenty, it actually would have sabotaged the ultimate purpose of Elijah's life. Because the season of drought and the season of dryness is actually what contextualized and created a setting where the prophets of Baal would show up at Mount Carmel to have idolatry removed. And so I say that to say this. Be careful who you attribute your dry season to. Be careful who you say, well, that, this is happening because of dot, dot, dot. A lot of us, when things dry up, we have a problem at work, we have a problem with our finances, we have a problem with, we're like, well, the devil's really been out to get me. You know, he's really been fighting. What if it's God proclaiming a drought so that you will come to the place that he wants you to be? What if it's God diminishing every other source in your life so that you will have to come to a place of dependence on him? Rather than us questioning why would God do that, why don't we just embrace that he loves us enough that he doesn't want to let us have inferior, resource, inferior sources of our dependence. So God dries everything up. Elijah prophesies the drought. And after he prophesies this terrible message to a king, something that nobody wants to do, the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, When did it come? When he had given the hard message that he didn't want to give. 
When he had said the hard thing that he knew would not win friends and influence people, when he knew he wasn't about to gain a whole bunch of Instagram followers, but he still obeyed God, gave the message, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, now you and I want to receive the, st the next step before we do the hard thing. Like, yeah, God, no, I will tell him that if you'll tell me what the next thing is after that so that I can know that you're not just going to leave me sitting there awkwardly with Ahab when I pronounce judgment over him. But Elijah doesn't get the next step until he completes the first task. One way to say it is this, is God's not going to give you step B until you complete step A. When I was 13, God called me to be a preacher. And I, I was not spiritually mature at 13. I know it's a shock. It seems like that's when somebody should have it all together and really be ready to go. But I wasn't ready. And so I, I, I ran from that call, and I was like, God, I don't want to do that. I'm like, my dad's a pastor. My family's, everybody's a pastor. So finally, I'm 18 years old. I'm about to get married. And I was standing at a youth conference. I had my hands raised. I'm praying. I'm like, God. Would you show me your will for my life? And I will never, it was like one of those moments where the presence of God was so thick, I'm weeping. Like, my eyes are just like, I'm, I'm just weeping. And I'm like, God, I need you to show me your plan for my life. And I've never felt, it was like somebody turned a water faucet off. Like the presence of God, and then it was like I ran into a brick wall. He said, I already told you. Like, why are you seeking me for direction when I've already given you the direction? All of us, we come to God and we say, God, I want to. Do, what, what is your will for my life? He tells us we don't like it and we say, okay, cool. But besides that, what is your will for my life? Like, I'll, I'll do a whole lot of stuff for you. I just don't want to do that. Elijah doesn't get his next step until he does the first step that God had given him. So the word of the Lord came to him. It said, get away from here, turn eastward, hide by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, I'm sure that if Elijah was like me, that he had some, some plans about where his ministry was going after it starts with the audience of a king. Like, probably the next step is I'm about to call Good Morning America. I'm about to do a tour. I'm about to be on the conference circuit. I'm going to be a New York Times bestseller. They're probably going to make a Netflix special about me when it's all said and done because I'm starting out right here with the king. It would seem like his influence should grow, like his, his platform should elevate. But look at what God says to Elijah as his next step. He said, go and hide. Lord, you don't, you don't understand marketing. You don't understand how this. You don't hide. He said, go by the brook Kareth and hide. Go be, go be outside of, of everybody else's influence, everybody else's mindset. Don't let people see you. And if I'm Elijah, I'm a, little, I'm a little frustrated, a little confused by what God is doing. But what God told him is he said, if I'm going to use you, your first step is not to garner greater influence, but to find your way to a greater level of insignificance. If you, if you really want to know how to grow in God, shrink in yourself. You want to know how to grow in who you are in the kingdom? Become less about your name, your reputation, your followers, your platform, and become more about how can I make his kingdom known on earth as it is in heaven. Can I tell you, some of the most kingdom influential people are some of the least known people in our society. Because the moment that you know my name and you attach my name to what God is doing, now who's getting the glory for it? See, that's the problem is we live in a society to where people can garner an influence out of nowhere. You can put a YouTube on on Monday night and on Tuesday morning you have 100,000 people that have viewed you and know who you are and garner an influence. And so we got people that are gaining influence on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and so many other ways that they're getting a platform. But they haven't gone through the process to develop the tools that they need to sustain the platform. And so they are incapable of truly being who they're called to be because they're given a platform too early. Big idea of this whole section is this, that premature platforms lead to misplaced glory. If God puts me on the platform too early, I'm not going to reflect the glory back to him. And so God, hide me until you're ready. In order for Elijah to be ready to step on Mount Carmel and eliminate idolatry and bring rain and plenty back to the nation of Israel, he had to be willing to go through a season of being hidden. He had to go by the brook and be hidden. It's a place of hiding. Got to move on. We have a tendency, when you, get, when you see this word careth, it, it literally means to hollow out or to dig or to empty. So God said, I want you to go to a place of empty. A place where everything is removed out of you, an emptying of yourself. And here's the thing. We have a tendency to ask God to fill vessels that haven't been empty. God, I want more of you. Would you fill me? Can I, 
Can I just tell you this? And I don't, I don't want to be too bold and too aggressive with this. But the Spirit of God does not cohabitate with anything. God is not going to allow His plans and His will to cohabitate with your ambitions. If you want to truly be in the will of God, now don't get me wrong, He may amplify and bring your ambitions to a new level, but until you lay your ambitions on the altar of His will, He's not going to cohabitate with it. Before Elijah could step into what God had for him, he had to go to a place of emptying and pour himself out to where the only source that he had was what God provided. The only thing that he could partake of was what God provided. And so he's sitting there, he's drinking from a brook in the middle of a drought, having raven butlers that are, I, I, I tend to think they might have been like, it looked like they had a tuxedo on when they brought the, the food to him. I don't know, I'm just making it up. It's not in scripture, so we can kind of interpretively move there. But he, they're bringing him food. He's eating this food. He's drinking this water. It's amazing because he's in this place of emptying. Now let's continue reading though. Because it says that he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed, the brook here flows into Jordan. Ravens brought him bread and meat. I love how nonchalantly it says this, as though that's just a normal thing, that ravens bring you bread and meat. In the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now look at verse number 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Now, Elijah has been obedient. He's followed God. He's been by this brook because God told him to go to the place of hiding, to be emptied. He told him, he told him all these things. And Elijah's there. And I just think it happened like this. Again, interpretive freedom, right? It's not, it doesn't say exactly how it happened. I think one day he went and got his cup of water and was drinking it and got to thinking, you know, this, this brook seems a little lower than it did yesterday. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's just me. But then the next day he came back, it's, it's a little lower. It's a little lower. It's a little. Until finally one day he gets his last cup of water out of that brook. And he thinks to himself, oh, no. This is my source of water. This is all I got. Like, it's not like he could go down the road to Walmart and get a, a, a 24-pack of, uh, of Nestle Pure Life. Like, that wasn't available to him. This was his source, and it dries up. It's amazing to me how sometimes you can be in seasons, and the thing that you were being sustained by, the thing that was making you comfortable, the thing that you had grown to love and you had grown accustomed to, all of a sudden it just... It dries up. It said that after a while, that word while is translated the Hebrew word kes, which means at the end of a definite time when a designation is reached. When he reached the, the destination that God had called him to, when he reached the place that God had called him to, when that season had accomplished its purpose, the brook dried up. Why? Because God loves you too much to let you become comfortable in a place that is not the fulfillment of your purpose. God loves you too much to let you just stay in a portion of what he's called you to. And so it seems mean, but it's actually a loving father that removes the source that's making us comfortable so that we'll get up and move on. If you read about eagles, the way that an eagle will kick its, its babies out of the nest, it's not because the mom don't love them. What it does is it begins to put sticks in the nest underneath the baby to where it can't be comfortable until ultimately the baby eventually has to jump out of the nest and potentially could die. But the choices are they either fly or they die. And you and I, we just want to stay in the nest. It's comfortable in the nest. I like the nest. Lord, I like it when I know how everything's going to work. I know how you're going to provide. I know how you're going to move. But sometimes God calls us to step into these things that don't make any sense. The brook dries up, and we don't know what the next step is going to be. And look at the next verse. It said that then, verse number 8, after the brook dries up, after the uncertainty arrives, then the word of the Lord came to him, saying. You and I, we want a little margin in our mission. Like, God... Tell me what's about to happen maybe a week before the brook dries up so I can like, you know, kind of get my mind around it. You know, I just, he waits until there ain't another drop in the brook. And then the word of the Lord came to him. Sometimes you don't receive a fresh word until you encounter a fresh worry. And a lot of us are wondering, why is this hardship in my life? And it's because you've been living in silence too long. You ain't had to take a need to God for like six years. And you ask him why things are getting uncomfortable. Because he loves you. He, God wants to bless you, but the only reason he wants to bless you is so you'll walk in relationship with him. Everything in our life is based around relationship and redemption. And when you and I get comfortable apart from God, he's going to find a way to bring us back to him. 
He'll dry up some brooks if he has to. When the brook dries up, then the word of the Lord came to him. Look at verse number 9. And it said, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've committed a widow to provide for you. Now, the word Zarephath, I told you that Kareth means to hollow out or the emptying place, the place of being emptied. Zarephath means refinery. It's the place where he was refined. And to go to the place of being emptied, you've got to pour everything out. You've got to surrender. And that's part of your, your Christian walk. If you haven't come to a place where you fully surrendered everything to Jesus, then, friend, I don't mean to be hard today, but I don't believe you fully, truly have a relationship with Jesus because you have to surrender everything to walk in relationship with him. And so the, the emptying place was first. But then after you've surrendered everything, after you've been emptied, you get refilled because that's how God works. He fills us back up. He doesn't just ask us for things so we can walk around empty. He asks us to be emptied so he can fill us. But then after you're filled, you then come to this place called being refined. And this is a fun season. Being refined is great. As God begins to cut things off of you. Let me, let me read to you the definition of what refine, being refined means. To refine means the removal of impurities or unwanted elements. When you and I are filled, we're filled with the Spirit of God. But we still have a tendency to welcome in elements that are impure. And they're not conducive to what God's called us to. And so the season of refining is God saying, hey, I know you like that, but I'm going to need that to go. Hey, I know you enjoy that. I'm going to need that to not be a part of your life anymore. I know that relationship, you really like that friendship, you really like that dating relationship, but it's keeping you from me. I know you really like for your entertainment to be that way. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm coming. I, I'm going to hit your road. Just hang on. <laughs> I, I know you like that. But you got to go through a place of refining. you got to go through a season of what we, uh, the old church would call it the season of sanctification. Can I just tell you, I, I told him in first service, I'm a recovering Pentecostal preacher and I'm in relapse. So y'all just going to have to bear with me. But... <laughs> I still believe in sanctification. There's still a calling to holiness. I know that's a cuss word. Still a calling to holiness. Scripture still says, be ye holy, for I am holy. It still says to come ye apart and be ye separate, and then I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. But the problem is, is that you and I, we want to follow Jesus without it cost us, costing us anything. We want to inherit his purposes without surrendering any of our desires. Season of refining is when he cuts that off that is not conducive to where he's taking you. The thing about, you know, it's, it's crazy as you begin to, to think about climbing a mountain, which I don't, but some of y'all weird people, that's what you want to do with your time. You want to climb mountains. But you see these documentaries of these guys that do like the, all the crazy mountain climbers or read articles. And depending on the elevation that they're climbing to, the higher the elevation, the less they bring with them. And you and I were like, God, I want to do some big stuff. I, w- I want to go, I want to go and, and, and reach the nations and change my generation and do all these things. And God said, all right. But big assignments require bigger refinements. If you want to do what God's calling you to and you want to achieve something great for him, I didn't really get many amens right there. I didn't really expect to. It's going to take a season of refining because every assignment requires refinement. Everything God calls you to, he's going to have to cut something out of your life. I got to move on. Y'all aren't amen enough. First, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't amen either. It kind of hurts. First Kings 17, verse 10. When he came to the gate of the city, indeed, there was a widow there gathering sticks. I love this because God's working on the other side of the equation. I don't got time to stay there. Verse number 10. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. I love this because, remember, they're in a drought. This is an element of sacrifice. For her to bring him water is sacrifice. Water is not a plenteous supply. And so she is is walking in obedience. You ever have this moment where you finally say yes to God and you're doing the thing? Y'all know that noble feeling you got when you do that? You know, like, God, you're just so lucky I love you this much. I'm just, you know. I don't think anybody else serves like I do. You know, I don't, I don't, you write the check and, man, I am so generous. Like, I just, 
You do the thing. She's walking in that level of obedience, feeling that nobility. And then this crazy prophet has the audacity as she's walking in obedience, going to get him the limited supply resource that is water. This prophet has the audacity to call her out in the middle of her task. And look what he said. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, "Uh, Ma'am, could you please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand as well? I know you're getting me water. I know that's a limited resource, but also I need something to eat. This is where the woman loses it. She's like, no, listen. I only got enough bread in my house, enough meal in my house to make one more piece of bread, one more meal for me and my son. We're going to eat that, and then we're going to die. And you're out here saying, would you bring me a piece of bread? You get your own piece of bread. Go find a raven. Like, you know what I mean? I, I think that's what... She's walking in a level of sacrifice, and God says, I want you to go to another level. We all want miracles on miracles, but what about when he asks for sacrifice on sacrifice? God, do more for me, but what about when he says, no, you do more for me? Uh Uh-oh. He said, "Please please bring me water in a cup. Going to get it. Bring me a morsel of bread. We like to think that challenging our comfort zone is enough when God's calling us to abandon our comfort zone. I'm doing, I'm going to sacrifice enough to where I feel it, but I'm not in this complete place of dependence. And that's the thing about all of it. It's, it God is not asking you to sacrifice to diminish you. He's asking you to sacrifice so that you will depend on him. That's the whole point of all of it. It says you depend on him. You draw closer. So if you're still in control of your life, you're not surrendered enough. I got to move on. Verse number 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar. See, I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself. My son Elijah said to her, do not fear. Look what he said. You're right. That's a good plan. Go make some food for you and your son. Eat it. Die. Have a good last meal. Whatever. Do not fear. Go do what you said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, I saw that this week, and I just got real excited in my living room when I saw those two words. And afterward, look at her plan. Her plan was, I'm going to make this food. Me and my son going to eat it, period, the end. Elijah said, that's a good plan. Make the food, eat it, bring me the cake, and afterward. Her plan didn't have an afterward. Her plan was based on limited resources. Her plan was based on, well, when this runs out, it's over. But Elijah said, if you will just give everything you have to the God of heaven, there's an afterward at the end of what you have. There's an afterward on the other side of that. If you'll bring it to him, if you'll trust him with what you have. I know ain't none of y'all old, I say old enough. I grew up in church that we basically were in the 1950s and 1990. So ain't none of y'all old enough to remember the song that said, little is much when God is in it. Y'all remember that? It doesn't matter what you bring to God. It doesn't have to be anything significant. It can be five loaves and two fish. Two fish, if you bring it to God, God's going to do something significant with it. It can just be a little bit of meal at the bottom of a barrel. But if you'll surrender it to God, God will make sure that it's enough to meet every need and then some if you'll trust him with what you have. I, uh, one, one reason, can I just commend this church? As I, I'm getting ready to close. If they want to go ahead and come get ready, I'm, I'm moving through this. But one of the reasons I I, I brag on this church all the time is because I was here during 2020. I was on staff, and I remember the internal conversations to where we weren't real worried, but but there were the conversations of, hey, we don't know what giving is going to look like. We don't know what's going to happen. And y'all crazy people, giving increased in the midst of a world pandemic. 2021 hits. Giving increases in the midst of... We about to, I mean, we are at the verge of a recession, and y'all giving forty thousand dollars to the Ukraine in one Sunday? I'm telling you. Why, why do I say that? Why, why do I why do I highlight that? Because I want to tell you, don't no matter how bad it gets, don't let that posture go away. 
Because it was the posture of giving everything, even when it hurt, even when it might cost more than I want to pay. When you have that posture, every time you go to the barrel, Scripture still says that He provides seed to the sower. And as you and I will sow, He's going to make sure we got some seed. As you and I will release it into kingdom purposes, He's going to make sure you're taken care of. Because I don't know about you, but my needs are not met by the American economy. My needs are not met by governmental supplements. My needs are met by the king that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And my God is still able to meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. The plan of God requires a high price, but that high price is accompanied by a high promise. If you'll surrender everything, he's going to meet every need. That doesn't mean we're, ever, we're never going to have hard times. Doesn't mean we're never going to question where's it coming from. I was talking with a, a pastor this week. I'll tell you this story. I got I to shut up. Like, I'm done. I got to move. I was talking with a pastor this week, and he was a church planner. And I don't know if y'all know this or not, but church planners don't make a lot of money. I don't know if you knew. It's, it's a secret, but he reached a, a season in their church where they had actually grown, and they had hired some full-time staff. But giving had diminished over the course of a few months, and so he said, we didn't have enough money to pay me and my staff. So he said, I, I told him for whatever time, just cut my salary. We're going to trust God. And he said, we went one night. My wife came to me. And she said, she said, honey, we, we don't got no food. I don't know what we're going to eat tomorrow. And he said, well, just trust me. Let, me. let me go try to figure this out. So he came back home, and he had a whole trunk full of groceries. I mean, she, he said it was a ton of food. She's like, where did you get all this? And he said, I'll tell you. If you promise me, you'll still eat it. And what he had done, he had went behind Publix and dumpster dived. And found, and you're like, that, that sounds crazy. And it does sound crazy. But for months, that was how he provided groceries. He said, one night I was in there, and there was this old piece of metal. He said, I could tell it was an antiquity. And so he said, I got it out. And he said, I got into a junk hauling business. So he got in this junk hauling business, and he's selling metal and selling these things. And he said, what I would do from that junk hauling business over the course of several months, he said, I would take pieces of furniture that I found in other places for my junk hauling business, and I'd sell it at antique stores. In the midst of selling at these antique stores, he met this guy who was an auctioneer. And the auctioneer, he had a very specific set of, of, of things that he sold. He sold Chinese artifacts and European antiquities. That's all he sold at his auction. So he said, this is you, you, all this during this time. I've been dump, dumpster diving, find metal, go to junkyards, all this stuff. So a guy starts coming to his church, starts giving over the course of several months. And he said, we got to talking. And the guy said, hey, this is a shot in the dark. I don't know. He said, but I'm looking for an auction house. He said, my, grand, my great, great grandfather, it was, it was several generations, was a Chinese general. And he said, he has all of this old war artifact stuff that I really, he said, it's in my storage. I don't got room for it. I'd love to sell it. He said, you're not going to believe this. But I know a guy that is an auctioneer that specializes in Chinese artifacts and European antiquities. Took all that stuff to auction. End of the long story short, the property that that church now owns was paid for with the tithe off of the auctioning of those Chinese artifacts. He said, he said, I remember being in that dumpster at Publix and saying, God, what are you doing? How much lower can you get? You never know what's going to happen when you bring God just a little bit of the meal in your barrel. A lot of us in the church, we preach, we like to preach prosperity. We like the the concept and that, that God's going to, he's going to give me houses and lands and cars and money. And I said this in first service, I'll say it again. You want to give me millions, I am here for it, Lord. Your servant is willing. I will receive it gladly and I will tithe handsomely. But one thing I've learned is that more than God wants us to live in prosperity, he values when we live in provision. The way that I explain it is like this. When I was a kid, played high school basketball, we would go on road trips. And I didn't make no money because I was a teenager. And, you know, 
I was broke. So I'd go to my mom before trips when I was a freshman, sophomore, and I'd say, hey, mom, I need some money. We got a basketball trip. Every single game, she'd give me a 10 or a 20. I mean, every, every road trip. You know what's crazy about that is that she never, like at the beginning of the season, she didn't just give me $1,000 and say, hey, this will take care of your needs for the entire season. Why? Because that's not how provision works. When you live in provision, it's not that God's going to give you a lump sum and now all your needs are met. When you live in provision, you've got to keep going back to the one that's meeting your needs. So he meets my need this time. I go accomplish the purpose with it, but i got to come back. And I'm so thankful that God loves me enough that he wants to walk in relationship and so he only gives me what I need for the moment. There's enough meal to meet the need for the day. And as she trusted him with what she had, he continued to give her what she needed. Man, I'm telling I don't know who this sermon is for. I had, I had a whole other sermon planned. I was going to preach on the other half of Elijah's life. And I started reading these verses for context this week. And man, God just arrested me with this portion of Elijah's life. I don't know who it's for. I'm breaking the rules. You're not supposed to preach new material when you're a guest speaker. But here I am. And I believe that God's dealing with someone's heart. That maybe you're in a season where you're about to say yes to God and you're about to step into some stuff that that you don't know what it's going to look like and and you're a little apprehensive because you know that trusting him is scary. And For that person, I just want to temper your expectations that it it probably isn't all going to be good and rosy and there's going to be some times you question it, but maybe you're in the room today and you've been saying yes to God and you've been living that life of obedience but you still find yourself in that place where the brook's running dry or you're at the very bottom of your barrel. And you don't know how in the world God's going to do it. And the enemy's been fighting against you. He's been trying to convince you that your struggle is an indication that God's done with you. And friend, I just want to let you know it's God inviting you into a deeper level of dependence. And as you answer that invitation, I believe, here's the beautiful thing about the life that lives in dependence is the life that lives in intimacy. And the greatest thing that lack can birth in your life is a closer walk with Jesus, a deeper prayer life, and a more generous spirit. I want you to stand with me today. I was preaching a couple weeks ago at our church, and one of the things that I said was I feel like that following God and saying yes to God looks a lot like this, and I had on the screen, it was an exclamation point, then a bunch of question marks, then an exclamation point, then a bunch of question marks. Because what happens is is God speaks to our heart, and and he tells us this is what you're going to do, and man, we just cry, and yes, Lord. I am going to reach millions. You're right. Like I am, you know. But then we encounter the next day. And it's not easy. And reaching millions starts with witnessing to one. And witnessing to one isn't nearly as exciting. Reaching millions starts with telling three people about Jesus and three of them telling you, no, it's not for me. Well, what you and I do is we get to the question mark and we forget about the exclamation point. We get stuck in the seasons of questioning and never return back to what God said to us. Today, I want to let you know, if you're in a season of discouragement, a season of depression, a season of doubt, whatever you're going through, don't forget what God's spoken to you, for you, over you. And the next time you hear it, and in fact, today, I believe God's going to remind you of some of those things. I want to encourage you to do something, and then I'm going to make the altar call. We're going to be done. When God reminds you, when God speaks to your heart today, whether it's a promise for the future or a reminder of what he's called you to, I want you to write it down. Whether you write it in your notes on your phone, whether you write it in a notepad, I want you to write it down. Because as soon as God says it to you, if you don't write it down, the enemy is going to come in and cause you to misconstrue what God said. And you're going to argue with yourself for the next two weeks that God, well, God didn't really promise me that. 
and you'll end up right back at the same place. But if you write it down, that's, there's, there's a reason why the prophet said, write the vision down and make it plain. Because you need to remember exactly what God said. Because what God said today is going to carry you through the storm of tomorrow. And if you forget the promises that God gives you in this moment, you're going to be overtaken by an enemy because God is speaking prophetically into your life. It's not as much that he wants to meet your need of today with the promise of today. He wants to give you the strength to overcome the attack of the enemy that's in your future. And so in your presence, he releases a prophetic word for tomorrow. But you've got to write it down. So I want you to bow your heads with me today. I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. Father, I pray that you would take everything that was said today, God, everything that we just looked at from the life of the prophet Elijah, I pray that you would somehow take it and shape it into exactly what every heart needs to hear. Holy Spirit, you are the one that conveys the message. We say the words, but you're the one that touches the hearts. And so, God, I pray that right now you would take every word that's said, let the word that is lingering in this atmosphere, I pray that by the power of your spirit that someone will be able to reach up and grab it and apply it to their life. And that, again, some people that maybe have been living in a season of silence would understand that the reason they're in a season of silence is because they've grown comfortable by the brook. But that now that the brook is dried up, you're ready to release a word again. It was then the word of the Lord came saying, maybe it's someone that, that there's, there's just a little bit left and they've been depending on a little bit of resources, but they're nervous because the resources are getting less and less. I pray today they would feel the invitation of heaven to release everything that they have into the kingdom and trust you completely because walking in dependence is walking in intimacy. I pray today that your word would speak to us exactly what we need to hear. They're going to go back into worship in just a minute. Every head's still bowed. Every eye's still closed. And first of all today, friend, if you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus, can I tell you that everything we're talking about and every promise that we're talking about, all of it is access to the finished work of Jesus on the cross because the reality is you and I were born into sin. We were born with a sinful nature. And there's nothing we can do to inherit the love of God or inherit the righteousness of God. But Jesus took our sin to the cross. He died for your sin. And he wants to forgive you of your sin and give you new life in Christ and walk in relationship. And all you have to do is put your faith in him. And so if you're in this room today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is a moment between you and God. You feel the spirit of God convicting your heart and saying, friend, I want a relationship with you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor Tyler. I want a relationship with Jesus. I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else today? Come on, slip it up high. Slip it up high. Don't be ashamed today. Anyone else? We got one, two. Anybody else? Say, that's me. You're not going to be alone today. You're not the only one that's stepping into the family today. Anyone else? I want to accept Jesus. Go hang out here for just a minute. Church, I want us to pray together. We've had a couple individuals that have said they want to receive Jesus. Friends, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But I want you to say this prayer together. And I want you to let you know these words don't mean anything. These words don't mean anything if your heart posture isn't sincerely in a place of surrender. So this is a template. We're going to pray these words together. Church, I want you to repeat with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for taking my sins. I'm sorry for the way that I lived. I repent of my actions. And I ask that you come into my life. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose again. And today, I want to make you the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church, can we put our hands together? At least two people that I know of that just gave their lives to Jesus. Friend, if you accepted Jesus as your Savior today, I know it takes a bold step, but if you would let them know at the first time guest booth, they want to put some things in your hand to help you in your walk with Jesus. But now for the remainder of you, the remainder of us. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor Tyler, I feel God calling me into a deeper level of dependence. I feel God calling me into something. Listen, we don't got to hang out for here for very long. They're going to go back into worship. But I want to let you know that I'm done. And I believe there's something significant about stepping out of our seat in response to the word of God. And so as they worship today, I want to let you know this altar is open. And if you feel God dealing with your heart for any reason, I want you to respond to that and take a step to say, God, I trust you. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to walk in dependence towards you. And so as they sing today, go ahead, Thomas, you can go ahead and begin. As they begin to sing, I want to let you know these altars are open. Let's worship together today. You are the 
Good hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done today. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name. Praise your name, Jesus. Isn't God good this morning? Hasn't he ministered to us this morning? Amen. God has been so faithful to us. And God is good. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap. Can we do that this morning? Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's also show Pastor Tyler some love this morning. Can, Pastor Tyler, we appreciate you coming this morning. Man, don't forget New Life Church next Sunday. You don't want to miss another powerful speaker in Mike Atkins next week. Church, let's close up with our benediction this morning, shall we? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you, church. We'll see you next Sunday. Amen.